Hey everyone, Chris here. So, knowing that high-level wizards can do some ridiculous stuff in D&D, I mean, that's old news. Creative uses of things like the Wish Spell, or True Polymorph, or as I shared in a recent video, Shape Change, those are all common ways. Simulacrum, of course, is infamous, as is Planar Binding. But recently, I experienced an interaction that I wouldn't have thought of in a million years. Raman Goblin is the guy who came up with the Double Phantom Rogue build, and he came up with a way for his wizard to become literally immortal and invulnerable with a build that I call the Ruby Mage. He came up with this crazy idea, then got together with Math Guy Dave, another name probably familiar to regular viewers, to make this crazy idea work for a 20th level game that I happen to be running. Now, once they had the build worked out, Raman contacted me to make sure that I was on board with him trying out this idea in my game. I mention this because if anyone watches this video and decides they want to try this out, you can't skip that step. Your DM is not going to be expecting this one, even from a high-level wizard. So here's the spell the entire concept is built around. Imprisonment. So here's what yours truly had to say about the imprisonment spell. My least favorite abjuration spell at this level is Imprisonment. This is again going to be one of those spells that if you're a DM and there's story reasons why you might want to have an Imprisonment spell in effect because we're bringing creatures from long ago or introducing creatures through an Imprisonment spell, you might want to include it in your campaign. But if you are a PC, you do not want the Imprisonment spell. And so what I appreciate about the creativity here is we're not just talking about a new idea for a spell that we already know is powerful, because it's a way to use a spell I thought was terrible that I wasn't expecting, and you can be sure that the designers were not expecting this either. So, Imprisonment says you create a magical restraint to hold a creature you can see within range. The creature makes a wisdom saving throw, and if they fail, they're bound by the spell. If they succeed, then they're immune to the spell if you cast it again. Now, while bound by the spell, the creature doesn't need to eat or drink, and it doesn't age, and it can't be located or perceived by divination spells. The spell ends based on a condition that the spellcaster sets, and when that condition comes to pass, the spell is over. Or, if a dispel magic is cast with a 9th level spell slot, targeting the prisoner's spell component used to create the prison. And there is a very, very costly component involved. It varies based on the version of the spell cast, but the value needs to be at least 500 gold pieces per hit die of the target. So you might have guessed at this point, our wizard is going to be casting imprisonment on themselves. Now, for this to work, they have to fail that wisdom saving throw. It says right here that if they succeed, they're immune to the spell if they cast it again. So failing that saving throw is essential. Now, me personally as a DM, I generally let player characters fail saving throw by choice, so in my game it didn't become an issue. But the rules don't specify that you can voluntarily fail a saving throw, though we are informed that that is going to change with the revised player's handbook. But then again, we don't know yet how this spell is going to look in the new player's handbook, so I have no idea if this is going to work in the next rule set. Now if your DM doesn't let you automatically fail a saving throw, that's not a big problem, you just need to set yourself up to fail. And it's not that hard. If you're 20th level and you have a plus 5 intelligence modifier, then your spell DC is 19 and that's before any additional modifications. So you're probably going to fail that saving throw anyways. Though you can do some additional things to make it more certain. Or even completely certain. So you could stay up for a few days until you have 3 levels of exhaustion to get disadvantage on the saving throw. Have another player cast Bane on you. That's a minus d4. A divination wizard might use Portent to guarantee a failure. An eloquence bard can use unsettling words to have their bardic inspiration die work against you. You could have a mind sliver cast on yourself for a minus d4. If you succeed, you could have somebody cast silvery barbs on you, so you have to re-roll. Or you might not need any of those things. Like, if your high-level wizard has even a plus one to spell DC due to like an arcane grimoire or something, then you could dump your wisdom, and then you dip artificer at level 1, and then you won't be proficient in wisdom saving throw, so you're going to have a minus 1 wisdom saving throw, and then you literally cannot succeed on the saving throw. A nat 20 is not an automatic success for saving throws, just for attack rolls. 
So the prisoner wizard selects is Minimus Containment. It says the target shrinks to a size of one inch tall and is imprisoned inside a gemstone. The prisoner can see out of the gem and others can see in, but otherwise nothing else can pass through, even by means of teleportation or planar travel. The gemstone is indestructible while the spell is in effect. So here is why this works. Minimus Containment doesn't put your wizard on another plane of existence. Inside the gemstone isn't considered an extra dimensional space. The wizard is just really small. You literally become an inch tall and then you're inside an indestructible gemstone. You can still take rests, you can still cast spells, you can still use any of the features you have. The restrictions to keep in mind though is that your wizard is always gonna be behind a transparent but indestructible barrier that they can see through and vice versa. And this is a severe restriction, but it's not an insurmountable one. So here's the main problem our wizard faces. They are inside a gem and anything they probably want to target with a spell is going to be outside the gem. And according to the rules on spell casting, we need a clear path to the target of a spell. Now I know players personally and DMs who figure that a transparent barrier doesn't qualify as full cover. So they allow casting spells through like a wall of force, for example. The issue is the poor wording of the rules for total cover that say a target has total cover if it's completely concealed by an obstacle. A transparent barrier isn't concealing anything. My personal opinion is they just use a poor choice of wording and what is meant by completely concealed is they mean that they're completely behind a solid barrier, as in completely covered, which would be consistent with the wording of half and three quarters cover. So my assumption here is the gemstone counts as total cover, and you definitely can't cast spells or attack through it, which of course is fantastic for your defense, but it would make a wizard pretty useless, unless we found a way to cast spells that don't originate from our wizard. Now there are a few different ways to achieve that in the game, but most of them cause conflicts with too many levels in multi-classing so you can't cast imprisonment in the first place, or conflicts with concentration. The one that seems to work just fine though comes from our good friend, the Order of Scribes Wizard. So at sixth level, we get the very powerful Manifest Mind feature that allows us to conjure forth what is a, essentially a spellcasting drone anywhere in an occupied space within 60 feet of us. So we could do behind full cover, we don't even need to see the space. So we manifest it outside the gym and then we can move it around with our bonus action. If you want a whole video devoted to Manifest Mind, I have one, so I'll link it above. But just quickly, it says whenever we cast a wizard spell on our turn, we can cast it as if we were in the Spectral Mind space instead of our own. So through a Manifest Mind, we can cast up to six spells per long rest, and we don't have to worry about being behind full cover. Oh, and our other good friend, our good old Found Familiar. It says when we cast a spell with a range of touch, the Familiar can deliver the spell as if it had cast it. The problem with Find Familiar is if the Familiar dies, we won't be able to summon it outside of the gemstone again. So the Familiar should probably be in its extra dimensional space most of the time. Then you can have it appear at times when it's not dangerous to deliver touch spells for you. I should also mention another option. Let's say you're a wildfire druid. Once you're sixth level, your wildfire spirit can act as the origin for any spell with a range other than self. And unlike Manifest Mind, that's not limited to six times per long rest. The issue is as a druid, you're not gonna get the imprisonment spell. So it's something you would wanna coordinate with the party wizard. In fact, what you could do is get two big gems, have the wizard cast imprisonment on the druid, and the next day cast it on themselves, and you have two invulnerable spellcasters. And let's talk about the gemstones for a bit. Just how confined are you? Well, that really depends. I mean, you're an inch tall. So whether the gemstone is just over an inch wide or more than that doesn't matter. So if we were to say, take something like stone shape, and create a bigger hollow gemstone, we could even open it up and provide furnishings in there, a little bed, a little desk, a little chair, and then use the spell again to close it back up, cast a spell, and we have a very nice little office to be imprisoned in. 
we should also talk about ways the spell might end. So first, as a spellcaster, we're going to choose a condition that's going to cause the spell to end and release us. This could be as simple as us choosing a command word that we can speak and the spell will end. So we can escape the gem anytime we want. The second is casting a dispel magic on the gemstone, but the dispel magic automatically fails unless it's cast with a ninth level spell slot. Now, this isn't something I think the wizard really needs to worry about. First off, with the current monster design, monsters with spells will have ones they can cast a certain number of times per day, but upcasting isn't even an option for them. But even if you face something that can use a ninth level slot to cast a spell magic, is that really so bad? An action and a ninth level slot, and what have they accomplished? They've released a high level enemy wizard from an imprisonment spell. Congratulations. And after that combat is over, and maybe after a long rest, if you've used your ninth level slot, then you can imprison yourself again. Okay, so we're in the gym, we're basically invulnerable. Now what we want to look for are good options for those six spells per long rest through Manifest Mind, good spells for touch spells through our Found Familiar, as well as spells that might be useful to cast while we're still inside the gym. It's also worth looking for other things that you can do behind full cover. So I'm going to share some of the tactics that they figured out. So first off, ability scores. This is just an interesting thing. You don't have to do this. Normally, you should never put an 8 in Constitution on a wizard. But if you are invulnerable, then you're not going to need to worry about hit points, and you're always behind an indestructible full cover. You don't really need to worry about Constitution saving throws either. Same goes for armor class. I would normally cringe at a wizard with an armor class of 12, even at level 1. But again, behind indestructible full cover at all times, so the character's armor class is actually irrelevant. Mind Blank is a good option for an 8th level spell. You can cast it on yourself because some psychic abilities don't care about full cover. Symbol is a good option since it's cast out of combat and has a range of touch, so a familiar can deliver the spell. Telekinesis is a great option and the option that was primarily used with this wizard. It uses one of your spell castings through your manifest mind, but once it's cast, you have a 10 minute duration and it gives you something useful to do with your action turn after turn. And you can also use it on the gemstone to move around. Since you aren't casting a spell after the original casting, all telekinesis says is you need to see the targets which shouldn't be a problem since you can see them through the full cover of the gemstone. A movable object is a good choice as well. We can cast spells while we're inside the gem, we just can't cast spells on anyone outside the gem. But we can cast spells on the gemstone itself. So you cast it from inside the gem on the gemstone, ensuring that your gemstone has become immovable, just in case you might get, you know, snatched up by an enemy or something. Speaking of casting spells on your gemstone, Catapult isn't just a good spell to take, it's a good spell to select with your spell mastery so you can cast it at will. Cast it on the gemstone and you can fling yourself around. This could be useful as a way to move or as a way to just destroy enemies. A lot of enemies will have nothing they can do against your character, so you can just catapult over and over and they probably won't even be able to move fast enough to get away. By the way, nothing but light can pass through the gemstone, so the telepathic feat is going to allow you to communicate since sound is not going to go through the gemstone either. There are some races that have telepathy as well, if you prefer. Eye Bite, another good spell to take, since it is cast on yourself, so you don't have to worry about casting through full cover. Then afterwards, use your action to choose a target you can see within 60 feet to effect. And I'm going to link Ramen Goblin's character in the video description if you want to take a look and see some of the decisions he made. But there is one thing I want to make clear as a sum up. Imprisonment is definitely not intended to be used this way. So it's not always 100% clear to me what works and what doesn't. Like, the character has the Magnificent Mansion spell. If they cast it, are they leaving the gym? If so, it doesn't work. Or is the extra dimensional space it makes inside the gym, so technically you aren't leaving? Well, in that case, it would work. 
It's all pretty unclear because these just aren't interactions the designers ever imagined. So working with your DM is pretty important here if you want to try out the Ruby Mage. So as I said, Ramen Goblin actually played this build in a 20th level game that I was running, so I should tell you how it went. Conveniently, the 20th level game had some goals beyond just staying alive. They had to protect some NPCs over a certain time period. And for that setup, the Ruby Mage was powerful, but not game-breaking. I mean, yeah, I had no way to hurt the wizard at all. He didn't take a single point of damage or need to make a single saving throw the entire time. And there was nothing that I could do that could change that in any way. So definitely the goal of the build worked 100%. I also figured that this is a tactic you could do with any run-of-the-mill Scribes Wizard at that level. It's not something you need to do all the time, so you could play a Ruby Mage for a few sessions, create the condition to end the spell, like a command word, then spend a few days outside the gem. Then you could cast it again to resume being a Ruby Mage later. You only need to purchase the component once, and like I mentioned earlier, a stone-shaped spell should be able to shape it however you want doesn't matter how thin the walls are, they're indestructible either way. So you can build a character around this concept specifically, or you can just incorporate this tactic into any high-level, everyday Scribes Wizard. Otherwise, hopefully the interaction is crazy enough that you found it an entertaining concept. So until next time, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks everybody, and I'll talk to you soon.